quantum field theory in a fixed background. I try to emphasize the two main uh, new things about a, a curved background, namely the ambiguity of a vacuum choice and the phenomenon of spontaneous particle production from the background. And this is uh, what this is the mechanism that inflation in, in inflationary backgrounds uh, produces the the fluctuations that we we see in the CMB and, and hope to see even more of. And then the last two lectures will be about things we haven't measured, but hope to measure, which uh, hopefully will give us much more information about the nature of inflation. So a brief recap. So the inflationary Lagrangian that uh, we've been studying is uh, probably the most vanilla uh, model of inflation, just single field inflation with uh, potential that uh, I just uh, required that it generates the, the uh, inflationary solution, which is a background that roughly speaking looks like the sitter space uh, and that for which the slow row parameters are small enough that I'm in the slow row approximation and can use the sitter mode functions to describe the, the particle production. And um, I explain this schematically, but because just because the calculation itself is hard, it takes time. I'm not going to be able to do it in real time. We would take the four lectures to derive the power spectrum and a bit of, the, a bit of what we're going to do today. But the idea is because GR is a system with constraints, uh, we specify a spatial metric on a three slice, and then these two other quantities are Lagrange multipliers. They don't have dynamics, so we should solve for them perturbatively and plug them back into the action. So that's how we got these, uh, the quadratic actions. Or I just told you the result. We didn't actually do the computation, but I recommend that you do it. It's educational. And uh, the result looks simple, but to get here takes uh, a bit of work. And uh, this is the power spectrum. So it's essentially the, the power spectrum, uh, the two-point function of a massless scalar field in the sitter space. The only uh, key point is that the normalization factor appears here. And because the normalization factors are different for scalar versus uh, gravitational fluctuations, there's a separation of, uh, of uh, powers. So, uh, there's a scale that separates the, the amount of power in gravitational waves versus in, in scalar fluctuations. And uh, so that's how we explain the fact that we have seen we've measured only these guys here and not these guys here. So today is all about uh, the next uh, correction to these uh, results. And I'm going to forget about tensors today, at least gravitational waves. So last lecture is going to be all about gravitational waves. So today I want to do uh, everything I can uh, about scalar fluctuations. So this is the plan. I had to shrink uh, quite a bit the things I wanted to discuss. I guess I was too, yeah, too much stuff. So I hope I can uh, go through these things um, with you guys. So the, the first uh, idea is to describe uh, self-interactions of the, of the inflaton, of this zeta fluctuation. So I'll describe, so this was first done uh, very carefully in a paper by Malda Senna uh, from 2003, 2002, 2003. Um, and there is, it's a, very nice uh, calculation, but the result is uh, undetectable. It's like tiny results. And I'll explain to you, I'll try to explain uh, schematically how we are able to uh, build a, a theory that enhances the, the size of the three-point function. Then I'll discuss a particular limit of the calculation in which uh, it's a consistency check. We know what the answer has to be. Uh, it's a bit like the Weinberg soft photon theorem, but here for inflationary fluctuations. In fact, it's not a bit like. I think it's essentially the same thing. And uh, then I'll use that as an excuse to say a few things about the SCFT. And finally, I'll talk about some recent uh, developments, uh, the idea of using these uh, inflationary correlation functions as a particle detector. 
Okay? So this, uh, this logo is uh, cosmological collider physics. So the idea is that inflation happens at very large energy scales. So you could have excited uh, particles that we don't have access to in our colliders, and they would leave imprints that cannot be mimicked just by self-interactions of the inflationary fluctuations. So the idea is how do we detect these things? Um, so that's the plan. So the, the first thing is uh, we want to discuss, uh, so we calculated uh, the free theory, just the two-point function of the scalar fluctuation. So today is all about the three-point function. So this is the observable. And we're going to compute today. And uh, it, it has many names in the literature. So it's called bispectrum which is a little bit uh, misleading because there is a bi, but uh, uh, it's three fluctuations. And uh, the four fluctuations is a tri-spectrum and so on. So I don't know why. Uh, I guess that the power spectrum is considered the uni-spectrum, and this is the bi-spectrum. This is, uh, of course, a three-point function. And uh, the, the final name or is uh, non-Gaussianity. The reason it's called non-Gaussianity is because uh, uh, if you have a Gaussian stochastic process or a free field theory, because of the weak theorem, everything is expressible in terms of the two-point function. So in particular, the three-point function should vanish. So a non-vanishing three-point function uh, is a sign of non-Gaussianity of the, of the stochastic process, okay? Uh, one thing is that, uh, remember here that momenta have to add up to zero, and that's just because of uh, the isometry of the background. So the, the background is, uh, I'm gonna use approximately the sitter space. So it's something like this. This is the background solution, and uh, then I have a uh, uh, translation, translation isometries, so I can talk about Fourier modes, and they have to add up to zero. So I have three Fourier modes here, and I'm, I'm gonna put the prime, just uh, not to write the delta function continuously of uh, momentum conservation. So they have to form a triangle. A1. Um, there's even an article in this Quanta magazine called Triangles in the Sky uh, about uh, this uh, type of uh, non-Gaussianity. So it's kind of a nice article. If you have a chance to read it, take a look. Um, okay. So, let's see. What, sh what should I tell you first? Okay. Uh, first thing I want to tell you is how to, um, there's a, a bit of a filter definition that I'm going to do, but it's to make the computation of the cubic action uh, easier. So let me draw a, a diagram to, con to uh, explain how we're going to calculate this thing. So the power spectrum, uh, zeta, zeta, a way to see um, how we're calculating is there is this, there is the beginning of inflation here, eta goes to minus infinity, and then we're imposing the condition that we're in the vacuum, and then there's spontaneous pair production, so the pair is produced, and then they, they just start moving in opposite directions because of expansion of uh, space time, and then here at late times, eta going to zero, their fluctuations freeze out. So this is uh, the diagram uh, that gives me the power spectrum. Okay, so time is going in this direction. For the three-point function, we're going to compute this time. So I have a, a some points here. There is spontaneous creation of uh, three particles, and then they separate. So 
this is the diagram. So to calculate this, of course, I need the cubic vertex. Okay. So, so that's the, our first task. So to calculate the cubic vertex, we need a little bit of a, a tweak here. It's just to make the calculation simpler, to, to make the inverse of the metric simpler to work with and so on. It's a redefinition that was actually uh, proposed uh, in the 90s by uh, Bond and Salopec, I think. So we're just gonna do a, a bit of a redefinition and this is a technical comment, but it's everywhere in the literature, so. So instead of uh, uh, one plus two zeta, we just uh, see that as the first uh, uh, term, first two terms in the expansion of an exponential. It's just so that the inverse uh, matrix, in the inverse three metric is easy to write down, okay? Um, so now, once we have this, we're gonna uh, stick it in the action. So let me describe the procedure in words and I'll just tell you the answer. Um, so the procedure has uh, quite a few steps. So first thing you do, you, so the goal is to find the cubic Lagrangian for the zeta fluctuation. So I'm gonna stick in the, the, um, the, mat, the three metric in the action, and uh, I'm using the fact that phi is phi bar of t, right? Remember that there's no scalar fluctuation. Then, N and Ni are gonna be Lagrange multipliers. I'm gonna solve these constraint equations. And uh, there is a neat argument by Maldacena that I, even though I, I need the cubic action, I only need to solve these constraints to leading order in the fluctuations, which I had to do for the quadratic action. So I don't have to solve again the constraint equations. So then I plug these uh, back in the action and then I work hard and get the cubic action. And the cubic action is a mess. And then there is, so let me, so solve constraints. And um, plug it back in the action. expand to cubic order. And there's a final problem with uh, the cubic action that uh, is the following. So you will find terms in the cubic action. So that, re remember that here uh, there is an epsilon in front of the quadratic action. It's because I can't access this gauge if there is no uh, there is no inflationary background, right? So there is no uh, Higgs mechanism when I'm at the top of the potential, when symmetry is restored. So the fact that I picked a clock allows me to eat the fluctuations of the scalar field into the metric. So the epsilon appears here, but somehow it doesn't appear in the cubic action. So there are terms that are naively not slow row suppressed, but then when you do the calculation, they, uh, they don't contribute to the three-point function if I assume that the mode functions are those of the sitter space. So what one needs to do is to uh, ensure that uh, one is using the cubic action, the, the, just the leading order in slow roll term. The reason why, um, I don't know if I'm making myself clear, so let me write it down. So S3 is gonna have a term that is order epsilon to the zero plus some term for the epsilon to the first power and then order epsilon squared. What happens is, so I'm, I'm in the slow row approximation. So I, I look at this and I'm like, oh, life is easy. I just, these are higher order in slow row. I just throw this away. And then I use the decider mode functions and do the calculation of the three point function here. I'll get zero. Um, then, I, what, what does it mean? It means that 
I used the wrong approximation. I used the Decider mode functions, but I'm in the inflationary background. I have to find the quadratic mode functions to next to leading order, which is uh, the first low row correction to the mode function. So then I'll get some epsilon to the one term. So I look at this and I say, okay, I just, so now my mode function, zeta classical, so I'm using interaction picture, and I need the, the mode functions at quadratic order, and we are using the leading order in uh, um, epsilon. Let me put the root epsilon here in front of the classical mode functions. Let me, let me write them down here so that you These are the mode functions, but this is in the sitter, and I'm just uh, adding the the the, um, the factor of m Planck uh, root epsilon here. So I'm assuming that it's uh, the correct mode function, but in fact there there will be corrections that are slow row suppressed. So there will be some order epsilon to the zero plus order epsilon plus order epsilon squared. So, so if I use these mode functions and stick them in here, I get zero. So it means I have to go to next to leading order. Now I should use this correction, stick it in here, and the decider mode functions, stick them in here. I get zero again. <laughs> so it, the first known leading correction is here. And then Maldacena figured out a beautiful trick of uh, using the Decider approximation, and at the same time taking into account the contributions from these two terms uh, without knowing these mode functions uh, beyond the Decider uh, limits. So you have to do filter definitions and, and play a, a sort of complicated game with the action. And uh, I just, I can't stress enough, you have to read the paper and do the calculations just because it's, it's, it's a tough calculation. At the end of the day, there is, so there is a, a, a filter definition. It's not the original zeta. I take zeta to some f of zeta. And uh, this filter definition essentially erases these terms here. So S3 written in terms of this f of zeta is going to be explicitly order epsilon squared. Okay? Epsilon squared times something else. And this is, the right, uh, uh, this is the right size of the cubic vertex. It has to be slow row suppressed at least. So you would imagine that at least it's epsilon to the one. But because everything is a weak coupling here, you would imagine that the coupling constant should appear more than it appears in the quadratic action. It turns out it does. But if you write the naive cubic action, it doesn't. So it requires quite a bit of work to get to this point, okay? Sorry that I'm not being explicit, it's just that this is a long, long computation. So once one lands in here, then uh, I can just proceed to do this calculation, okay? So after all of this work, I tell you that there is a single term in the cubic action that we need to worry about. And the term is of this form, and it will look a little bit weird, but uh, trust me, it's correct. A to the fifth epsilon squared. H, I, I set M Planck to one, sorry, I forgot to uh, see what's the zeta dot. Then there's an inverse Laplacian, zeta dot squared. And uh, let me call this thing here zeta C, because it's not the original zeta, I had to do a few field redefinition. So this is the action. You might be uh, worried about this uh, one over Laplacian here, so it's non local. But if you do uh, electrodynamics in the Coulomb gauge, uh, you'll see that these uh, non local terms uh, are induced if I do perturbation theory. It's just, uh, it's just because we're trying to uh, remove all the, 
all the gauge redundancy of the theory, and the price we pay for that is that locality is not manifest in the action. The, technically, the way that uh, inverse Laplacian appears is through this guy here, Ni. So when I solve for Ni, I have a scalar uh, variable, um, zeta, and Ni will be roughly speaking of this form, di, zeta, um, something like this. I have to solve an equation where the Laplacian of Ni is given by di, zeta. So then Ni will be given by inverse Laplacian times di, zeta, okay? Yes, spatial Laplacian, yeah. Yeah, so here I'm uh, explicitly breaking uh, time-space uh, uh, symmetry. So yeah, so all of these uh, d partial derivatives here are spatial. So this is a problem. So here, if you're an experimentalist, you would just give up because it's a problem. It's a, it's a tiny signal. And I'll give you some numbers in a little bit. And there is other stuff here that is even more subleading. So now I give you some cubic vertex and uh, I have to calculate this three-point function here, okay? The way to do it is uh, through something called the, the Keldish technique or schwinger keldish method. So when I'm given a, a interaction vertex, uh, we learn uh, in quantum field theory to use Feynman perturbation theory, right? But in Feynman perturbation theory, what we're really c computing is uh, some in out correlation function with some time ordering maybe divided by in out. So this is Feynman perturbation theory. And uh, if the vacuum is stable, there is no particle production, out is just the phase times in. So the phase upstairs cancels with the phase downstairs. And Feynman is essentially indistinguishable from uh, schwinger keldish type of uh, perturbation theory. But here, the particle actually, uh, pr uh, sorry, the vacuum uh, produces particles, so we need to be careful. We actually specify the initial states, and then we calculate an expectation value at late times. So what we want is in, zeta, 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 in. So there is only a single time evolution operator when I do this calculation in uh, Feynman perturbation theory. Okay? So there is this, uh, the path integral is doing time evolution from minus infinity to plus infinity. Here I have to do time evolution twice. I evolve from minus infinity, the, the initial states, to the time at which I'm inserting these operators. And then I have to produce, uh, uh, I have to produce the cat. So I have to evolve backwards in time. I evolve from time t back to minus infinity. So this requires a slight modification of standard perturbation theory. It's called schwinger keldish or in-in uh, perturbation theory, okay? So the path integral actually doubles. You need to talk about uh, uh, twice the number of fields and it's, uh, it's, it was uh, used by a condensed matter physicist quite a bit and uh, I think it's described very neatly in a paper by Weinberg. So there's a paper by Weinberg in which he actually tried to compute the one loop correction to the power spectrum and then uh, he wanted to develop this in in, you know, Weinberg-esque detail. So uh, you should take a look at uh, Weinberg 2005. He has a whole appendix in which he describes this um, in a lot of detail. For us, because we're just interested at tree level, it's very simple. It's a, a mild modification uh, compared to Feynman uh, perturbation theory, so let me just explain to you the, the result.
get my notes so I get the right factor. So I'm going to be a little bit abstract, but I have a, a state uh, psi, and I have an operator O at, that I'm computing. At, I want to know its expectation value at time t naught, and then I want this uh, correlation function here. So I, I'm, we're doing interaction picture, so we start with the free vacuum, and then we're going to do time evolution on both sides. So we need the Dyson uh, uh, time order exponential interaction Hamiltonian. So this is standard, but now uh, I do time evolution from minus infinity until time t naught. Then I evolve the, the, the vacuum states all the way to time t naught. Then I, I stick in the operator O. And now I have to evolve, I have, this produced the cat. Now to produce the bra, I need to uh, take the, uh, the dagger of this thing here, and then I'll get anti-time ordered, e to the plus i integral minus infinity to t naught of a, the interaction Hamiltonian. Okay. So it's a little bit different from uh, standard Feynman perturbation theory because now there are these two, uh, time orderings here. So in Feynman, what you do is uh, you have your operator insertion here, let's say a T naught, and then uh, you, you do time evolution from minus infinity until time T naught, and then from T naught to plus infinity, okay? So this is Feynman. This is ti the time evolution operator from T naught to plus infinity minus infinity t naught. In schringer keldish we go all the way to t naught and then we come back, okay? Because we're only interested in three level, we just need the, the first term in these exponentials. It's going to give me a commutator, some uh, sort of retarded Green's function. So that's the difference between using Feynman or retarded Green's functions at, at three level. Okay, so um, for three level, we get this psi OT naught psi equals minus I zero naught integral minus infinity to t naught, h inverse t, final thing is, uh, so there's just, the commutator is just coming from this guy here, uh, added to this guy here, that, that's what gives me the commutator, okay? Final thing is that there is an i epsilon prescription, so the, the integral when I go to minus infinity, uh, recall that the mode function has this uh, exponential here. So when I go to uh, minus infinity, this thing oscillates very fast, and then I'll use the Feynman i epsilon prescription and the time coordinate just to damp this exponential here, okay? So that's, that's it. And then, so I know the cubic action, I know uh, the prescription, and I know that once I do this calculation, I have to undo this field redefinition because zeta was the actual variable that is related to the curvature fluctuations. So you have to do all of this work and you get some results for this three-point function here. So the result Is, uh, is usually called the bispectrum. Oops, B of K1, K2, K3. And uh, okay, it's a, it's a rational function of the momenta, and it has low row parameters in front of it, and it's tiny. Okay, if I write it, it's not gonna give you any insights, but you can look at uh, Maldacena's paper for the specific shape of this thing. 
What, what happens with these uh, objects is that one thing that gives you some insights is the following. So recall that I have a triangle. So now, I, in the case of the power spectrum, the only thing I could dial was the, I had the segments, right? So because of momentum conservation, I just have a, a length scale to work with. So the only thing I could do was dial the, the size of the, of the wave number. Here, um, and, and scale invariance tells me that it doesn't really matter uh, what the size of this, uh, of this uh, wave number is. The red tilt just tells me that there's a mild uh, uh, damping of the power spectrum as I, go to, as I change the, the wavelength, okay? So now here I have much more freedom because I have a triangle so I can dial the, not just the size, expand it, but I can also change the shape. So when you uh, read the literature about this thing, people, uh, uh, people talk about different shapes of the triangle. And I'm gonna contrast two different shapes, uh, the equilateral shape versus the, this squeezed shape. So this is called equilateral versus squeezed. Now here is now there here is some uh, physical uh, information about the answer. In single field inflation, squeezed is zero. So in the squeeze limit, you get something that is essentially zero. Okay. And uh, so the the this bispectrum peaks around the equilateral. And so bispectrum peaks, it, has, it, it puts most power in the equilateral shape. So that's interesting because if I measure this bispectrum, okay, and I go to the squeeze limits, and I see something, then it's not single field inflation. I ruled out single field inflation, okay? All, and uh, okay, I, I did one example of single field inflation, but this is actually a universal, it's kind of a symmetry statement, so that's what I uh, want to spend a little bit of time telling you about. So this is true for all single field inflation models. This was pointed out actually by Paolo Creminelli here at CTP with uh, Matias Adariaga in 2004. So this squeezed shape is actually a smoking gun of uh, something other than uh, single field inflation, which is nice. And uh, actually it's the, it's the shape that is uh, uh, mostly, it's better constrained by experiments. I don't know why, uh, I'm no specialist on this, but um, the equilateral shape is much harder to constrain. But as I said, because of the extra factor of slow roll, this is essentially hopeless, okay, for single field inflation. Let me explain to you um, how we quantify whether it's hopeless or not and give you a sense of numbers, things that we can actually measure and things that are way beyond our dreams. I'm gonna write the, the way we quantify sizes of uh, three-point functions and then I think it'll be a good time to, uh, for questions. Uh, because I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. So quantifying non-Gaussianity. So if you, if you open Planck's paper on non-Gaussianity, you'll see this thing here, FNL. This is how people, uh, associates a number to non-Gaussianity. So non-Gaussianity is a, a triangle-shaped function, but then uh, for a given uh, template, so this is a 
complicated function. For a given template, people associate a number uh, to it because uh, when, you, when you actually try to look for this in the data, uh, I don't think that we have enough, uh, uh, enough statistics to be able to actually see the precise shape. We can just measure whether the three-point function is zero or non-zero and study a bunch of uh, equilateral triangles versus a bunch of uh, squeezed triangles and so on. So the way that people put constraints on non-Gaussianity is by this number F and L, which uh, I'll show you the definition is a little bit weird. So I'll take my bispectrum, my three-point function, K1, K2, K3, and it doesn't matter whether it peaks in equilateral or squeezed, I'm gonna calculate it uh, in the equilateral. Shape, okay. Of course, this uh, function can be evaluated for any shape of the triangle. So I'm gonna evaluate it for the case of an equilateral triangle. And then I'm gonna divide it by the power spectrum so this is, uh, there's a single K uh, that, that enters the game. And then I'm gonna calculate the power spectrum at the same value of K and square it. So this is a, a kind of historical definition of uh, a quantifier of non-Gaussianity. It was, uh, I think, first proposed, I think, by uh, Komatsu and Spergo. But uh, if you just count zetas here, it seems like a bad idea because each zeta is around 10 to the minus five, right? So F and L being large is, still means that this three-point function is, uh, can be relatively small. So you'll see bounds on non-Gaussianity, relatively large numbers, and you'll be, wow, the experiment is terrible. But actually, it's just because uh, there's an extra 10 to the five here. Okay. So for slow roll inflation, which was uh, Maldacena's calculation, F and L, uh, the, this uh, shape function peaks around the equilateral uh, configuration, but F and L is of order slow roll factors, epsilon, eta. So even though I'm paying an extra uh, 10 to the five here, the size of the non-Gaussianity is uh, probably or the 0 0.01. So this, okay. I'll explain things that we, I'll, I'll mention things that we use to, to measure non-Gaussianity and there's some dream that there's a way to, to measure this using uh, uh, 21 centimeter uh, radiation from the dark ages. That was it on the news recently, there was some claimed uh, detection of the, of the monopole of this radiation. So this is tiny, but th there are ways of enhancing this within single field inflation. And uh, pro probably the most popular way is by, uh, so, it's, so let me say it's possible to enhance Gaussianity in single field inflation. And the way to do that is by uh, making the scalar fluctuations uh, badly break uh, uh, Lorentz or the Sitter symmetries. So the way to do it is uh, by, by giving uh, zeta a small speed of sound. Yes. So um, the only way I know how to explain this is by writing the Lagrangian. You'll see that if I, uh, because of the nonlinearly realized symmetries, the 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 interaction vertices they they are con so the 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 vertex that controls the size of the speed of sound there will be a sorry the, so the term in the Lagrangian. Uh, I write some Lagrangian for the zeta fluctuations, okay? So there will be a term that I can uh, change that will control the, the speed of sound. What happens is that when I uh, dial this term, it, it doesn't change only the speed of sound. It, it, it doesn't just uh, dial the quadratic zeta action. 
it also um, dials the cubic zeta action. So when I decrease the speed of sound, I enhance the size of the cubic vertex. And this is because of nonlinearly realized symmetry. So the, the, the CS squared is appearing not just in front of some zeta square term, but also in terms of in front of some zeta cubed term. And uh, there's a nice way of uh, seeing how that works, but I'm not going to do it. Unfortunately, I don't have time. But I can give you a reference where this is done. So let me just give you the size of FNL when the speed of sound of, uh, of the scalar fluctuation is small. Okay, so by speed of sound, let me just uh, write down the formula. By speed of sound, I just mean uh, that the quadratic action for zeta is going to have uh, uh, some detuning. So it's going to be something like 1 over cs squared zeta dot squared minus uh, here minus a di zeta squared. Okay? So when I give some speed of sound to to the zeta fluctuation, it just so happens that uh, there will be a cubic term here, zeta dot cubed or something like this, that goes like um, 1 minus 1 over cs squared. Okay. You can't just dial this guy here and uh, uh, get rid of the, of the cubic term. That's the, the beautiful thing about uh, the fact that symmetries are being nonlinearly realized. And um, so when, when I make CS small, I enhance the size of the cubic vertex and non-Gaussianity is large. So that's probably the most popular way of enhancing non-Gaussianity in single field inflation. So then FNL in this case will be order uh, 1 over CS squared. And uh, actually, the current bound on CS is not very strong. So CS has to be greater than or equal than 0 0.024. So this is the current Planck bound. So it, there is a lot of room for a crazy small speed of sounds. The reason why the bound is, uh, is uh, weak is because the it, the non-Gaussianity peaks in this equilateral shape, and just a constraining equilateral non-Gaussianity is hard. Okay. So that's the, that's the story. So before, before I continue, are there questions? Yeah. Don't you have constraints? Or... No, because uh, the, the CS will appear in the power spectrum. It's just some extra parameter. So now you have like uh, some epsilon CS. So now we're not measuring uh, we're not measuring uh, uh, H over M Planck times epsilon. We're measuring this thing here. So because I introduced an extra factor, I need to do more experiments to to disentangle um, things. So what what one can do is there there's an extra term that uh, uh, will kill this thing. But then I have to start doing a lot of fine tuning to uh, make this non-Gaussianity disappear. So if you don't have a fine tuned theory and the speed of sound is small, you will generically have large non-Gaussianity. And uh, the bound is pretty weak. It's just because equilateral non-Gaussianity is hard to constrain. Well, squeeze non-Gaussianity is, uh, is in much better shape. And uh, do I have here? The yeah, I don't have the current bound on on, on uh, local non-Gaussianity, but I can I can bring it tomorrow. Let me um, let me explain. So, yeah. Yeah, you can, and uh, yeah, this is this uh, thing here is coming from some effective field theory that is essentially parametrizing to uh, leading order and derivatives 
all sorts of cubic terms. So I'm not doing a single field inflation with some extra, some extra terms. So to actually to make the speed of sound small, uh, one needs to forget about the background theory. So one needs to build an effective field theory just for the fluctuations. Forget about the, the back. So, okay, let me say it uh, in a different way. So the reason why uh, in slow row inflation the non-Gaussianities are small is because we are controlling both the background and the fluctuations with a weak coupling expansion. So we're paying extra prices of, of slow row. If one builds an effective field theory just for the fluctuations and forgets about where the background evolution comes from, then I can enhance non-Gaussianity. So that's part of the reason I can get rid of some of the, I can get rid of the factor of epsilon. So now I can make non-Gaussianities be order one, and there's the extra one over CS squared when I make the speed of sound small. So this uh, type of effective field theory just assumes that it's single field inflation. So it will, it will, um, it will include something like Starobinsky inflation, like R squared or, okay. All right. So let me describe a bit the, the squeeze limits because then I can uh, make a contact with soft limits and uh, uh, tell you a bit about the SCFT. I guess I'll leave cosmological collider physics for tomorrow. Um, So the, the interesting thing about B, the, this bispectrum, so there are two uh, interesting facts. So I'm, I'm going to write an expansion around the squeeze limits. So I'm taking K1, K2, K3, K1 much smaller than K2 and K3. And then I have a... Um, not here. I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to write it as the power spectrum of uh, K3. Um, sorry. One K2. So the limit as K3 goes to zero of the bispectrum is going to be, give, be given by P of K3, power spectrum of K1, and then some sum N from zero to infinity of K3 over K1 to the N times A N, okay? So this formula is already a bit non-trivial because I'm assuming that uh, there is a Taylor expansion of this squeeze limit, okay? Uh, but just believe me, any single field model will have this uh, Taylor expansion and all the exponents are integers, okay? The interesting thing is that all single field inflation models give same A0 and A1. So you only start uh, 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 seeing the difference between what single field model you're working with at A2. A A2 carries new information. So notice that uh, this bispectrum, I'm writing it just in terms of the power spectrum. So in principle, if this is true for any single field model, and actually, uh, maybe let me write down what the answer is. So A naught is um, mm -mm, one minus NS, the scalar uh, spectral index, so it's tiny. Remember that this is a 0 0.04, and A1 is, uh, okay, I don't quite remember, but it's something like a D1 minus NS, okay. 
it's also essentially so essentially uh, uh, negligible. Okay. So these two terms are essentially negligible, and moreover, they're all determined by the power spectrum. So in fact, by knowing the power spectrum, I know the first two coefficients in this squeeze limit. So it means that it's giving me no new, new information, right? I know the power spectrum, I know the bispectrum to leading and next to leading order in this expansion. So this is exactly like a soft theorem. I can determine the, the n point correlation function by knowing the n minus one point correlation function. And there are versions of this for as many legs as you would like, okay? So for four legs, for example, I can take one of these legs here to, to be very small, or I can take the diagonal to be very small. So there are all sorts of soft theorems related to this. And I think they're identical to the Weinberg. Uh, the details differ a bit, but they are identical in spirit to the Weinberg uh, soft photon theorem. Okay. So A2 is really where, uh, where new physics kicks in. And that's uh, also where uh, cosmological collider physics uh, uh, will appear in this, in this expression here. So, but I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. I want to explain uh, a nice way of uh, seeing uh, where this thing comes from. And so the standard uh, proof of this, uh, of this soft limit is the following. So, a very, so in this limit here, What's going on? So this mode, the, the one with a very small wave number, it has huge wavelength. So it goes outside of the horizon way before the modes of, uh, of uh, wave number K1 and K2. Okay, so recall that we are computing diagram like this. But now we are in a situation where uh, one of the modes exits the horizon way, way before the two other modes exit the horizon. Okay, and now if you look uh, back at what I erased, but just gij was something like a squared e to the two zeta, okay, delta ij. When this guy freezes uh, and is way outside of the horizon, I'm essentially again in, uh, in, the, in the original background, right? If I put some zeta long here, that has no uh, time dependence and uh, whose wavelength is enormous. This is just some number, it's just rescaling the coordinates. So it's, it's as if I was doing the calculation of the power spectrum in a different coordinate system. Okay? So that's the intuition. So that's why uh, in this limit, I'm actually kind of remeasuring the power spectrum or the bispectrum is completely determined by the, by the bispectrum. So this is the standard um, reasoning. This is explained in uh, Creminelli and Zaldariaga. And even uh, Maldacena's original paper. But in this paper, here's a short paper, 2004. They just uh, give the arguments that it works for any single field uh, theory of inflation. But I want to give you a different argument because it's going to uh, allow me to uh, introduce the SCFT. So in the last five minutes, I'm gonna tell you all about the SCFT. So that should tell you something about how much we know on the SCFT. So the SCFT, oh, there is some example, and actually one of the creators is up there. There is one example by uh, Aninos Hartmann and Strominger but it involves this uh, Vasiliev theory, and uh, it doesn't seem to have a, a controllable limit in which you look something like Einstein gravity or things we expect uh, inflation to look like. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that almost everything we know about the SCFT is coming from some sort of analytic continuation of ADS-CFT. So the, the statement of DS-CFT, um, at least the, the the one by Maldacena, is that the wave function of the universe is a function of, 
GIJ, this GIJ I've been writing is the beginning of the lecture. Can be, this wave function of the universe can be calculated by a partition function of some field theory. So I'm going to call it CFT, where this GIJ is a source okay, for the partition function. So this is the statement. Uh, let me explain what this wave function of the universe is and how it's related to the things we've been computing in the lecture. So the wave function of the universe is um, the question, if I specify a bunch of Davies initial conditions as eta goes to minus infinity, and then I tell, I just want to keep track of a history that for at late times, as eta goes to zero, we'll have the profile gij of x. So this is a th three metric, okay? It's a three-dimensional metric, one dimension less than the, than the bulk. And uh, the question is, what's the amplitude for uh, this process to happen? So this is what the wave function gives me. The actual expectation value, uh, something like a g, g, is going to be given by the Born rule. So I have to integrate uh, psi of g squared times, let's put g of x, g of y, for example, g of x, g of y, and then divided by psi squared. Okay. So this is uh, a device that is kind of a, a half step away from uh, the expectation values we've been computing. Okay. So, but the, the interesting thing is that the, the wave function should resemble a partition function of a conformal field theory. So I'm going to write the wave function in a way that is um, very suggestive. So the wave function can be written as the exponential. So uh, let me write it for, for, uh, for some gij, okay? So we know from ADS-CFT that the uh, operator that is dual to the metric is the stress tensor. Okay? And uh, we are zeta and the tensors, they are essentially just components of the metric on the three slice. So we're going to write the gij x gkl of y. And if you recall how ADS CFT works, you will not be surprised if I call this. So there's some coefficient here in front of the wave function. Recall that the argument of the wave function is this gij. And I'm going to call this thing gij of x kl of y x dy one six i j k l m n i j k l m n z y x Z, Y, X. Plus, etc. Okay. So, uh, just from this formula, it's just a, a way of rephrasing this formula into something a little bit more useful. Okay. And uh, finally, I will write down uh, the expression for the zeta two-point function in. So suppose I know these coefficients, and I'm just, it's just a relabeling. I'm just calling them the correlation function of the stress tensor in some random field theory that looks like a conformal field theory. Okay. So this is going to be given by, by minus 1 times 2 times the real part of TT. So this is in momentum space. So you just have to Fourier transform what I wrote here, rewrite it in momentum space, and uh, the zeta three-point function. I'm just doing the uh, Gaussian integral. 
by expanding this exponent here, and it's going to give me 2 times real TK1, TK2, K3. One T minus K one minus K three. This is all without delta functions. Okay. Uh, the real parts are coming from. Uh, sorry, it's too real. Too real. The real parts are coming because I have two mod squared the wave function. Okay. Yeah, they're connected Green's functions. Yeah. It, it's, just, it's just some ansatz for the wave function that makes it easy to relate uh, the three-point functions to these uh, putative uh, CFT things here. But it, yeah, it's just a, a, a way of writing the, the wave function that agrees with what you should see from perturbation theory. I'm just calling these coefficients uh, uh, correlation functions of the stress tensor. So because it's zeta, this is the trace of the stress tensor. So actually, in a conformal field theory, all of this is zero, which is just stating the fact that to see the zeta fluctuation, I need to have a, a breaking of the Sitter symmetries, OK? Because I have to go to this uh, uh, unitary gauge. But um, so it's, a, it's a almost conformal field theory, because we want to be in, in quasi the Sitter space. So I have to break a little bit conformal symmetry in order to generate a trace of the stress tensor. But the interesting thing, now that I have a minus couple minutes, is that it relates these, um, these uh, expectation values to correlation functions of the stress tensor. And at three points, you should be very happy, uh, because at three points, we know these things. Right? We expect, at least in a conformal field theory, to know these things. So I'll have a little bit more to say about that tomorrow. But I want to just explain from the point of view of uh, the CFT where these um, um, soft theorems come from. So the soft theorems just come from the word identity for the stress tensor. So that's the, so the, the fact that the stress tensor is conserved inside of a, an expectation value uh, is all we need. So this is the soft theorem. So this, this is a story about a background wave and calculating something on the background wave. I have to treat every case separately. I have to treat, you know, squeeze limits with a, a diagonal versus squeeze limits with, a, um, I mean, this type of squeeze limits in which I take the diagonal to zero versus squeeze limits where I take this size to zero. It's all separate, and I will only get the, the Maldacena results. You need to work much harder to get this result. This result is from 2002. This result is from 2010. Okay, so it took people a while to figure out this thing. From the point of view of the CFT, all soft limits follow from this formula. Because when I take a functional derivatives of the covariant derivative here, uh, I'll I'll actually pick some contact terms. So it's the fact that the stress tensor inside of a correlation function is conserved modulo contact terms. So when I translate this statement into a statement uh, for these um, inflationary correlators, then I'll get all the soft limits. So I think that that's uh, kind of neat. So I, this is, even though the SCFT doesn't exist, this connection kind of already teaches you something, which I find nice. So because I'm five minutes over time, let me stop here.